Houston, and Justin and I were really excited. This is our first ever recording a podcast here at the museum um, about Donnie. He's a podcast host, budding rap historian, DJ, and producer. Um, born Dondrick Joseph, he's, he's constantly sought elevation out of his talents, from his bedroom picking through vinyl as a teenager to going on to graduate from TSU with a degree in journalism. Oh, it was very informative. It was nice. I learned a few things I didn't know about Mike Frost or Georgie, but I appreciate it. Salute to Donnie Houston. He always had a knack and desire for telling stories, whether it be behind the turntables, queuing up hits to put smiles on people's faces. Oh, it was good. It was it was a, it was good to see like both sides, like the old and the new, um, together, and like how they have like some of the same mentality. Good Houston culture. Creating an atmosphere that transports you to a moment or a scene in time with music production, or simply a laugh or two via voice acting. Donnie Houston's list of guests and collaborators include Bun B, Jay Prince, Mike Dean, Matt Sanzala, Slim Thug, and Ninth Wonder, but I'll let him introduce his guests for this evening. Please join me in welcoming Donnie Houston. Okay, can everybody hear me? We're good? Okay, so let me ask y'all before I do this, because I didn't follow all the protocol, but I am vaccinated. Y'all my card, y'all want to see it. Is everybody cool if I pull my mask down? Yeah. You good with that? Yeah. Okay, cool. What's going on? How y'all doing? <laughs> y'all no sound? Okay. We'll figure it out. <laughs> um, yeah, my name's Johnny Houston. This is Johnny Houston Podcast Live here at Contemporary Arts Museum. Uh, my two guests today are Georgie Casanova and Mike Ross. Uh, these two are responsible for, you know, the way we see Southern culture and hip hop, especially coming from Houston and Texas. I would say, you know, dating back to the 90s with, with Mike. And Mike is still going, and Georgie picking up in 2000, but he's going, you know, with photos and design and fashion and video spray and all of that. So, y'all make a round of applause for Mike Ross and Georgie Casanova. Just to be next to Mike too, you know what I mean? This is, this is definitely appreciated. Yes. What, what, what do you know about Mike? We're going to get to Mike and Mike get you know what I mean? So what do you, so you sit next to Mike, what does that mean, man? Oh uh, man, a lot, man. Uh, anybody that knows pretty much my poem knows how inspired I was. And you can kind of see it in my early work from Mike, you know what I mean? I grew up seeing a lot of his work and all the promo posters from back in the day. So it, it's, 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 it's dope to be here, you know what I mean? Uh, Mike Frost, what's going on, man? Man, I'm doing good. Y'all give it up for Mike Frost, man. Right? Okay. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Might have to take this jacket off. I might start sweating in a second. No, <laughs> no, it's a it's a blessing, man. The life's been real good. Yeah, yeah, cool, man. So um, I mean, we don't have a whole lot of time, so we'll just get straight to it, man. Mike, just talk about, you know, how you even got into imaging and and graphics and everything like that. You know, um, really, like, uh, I guess I'm one of those people that if I'm not interested in something, it's hard for me to do. Like, if I'm interested in something, like I I go you know, I just go into it and I just realized early on, like I wanted to do creative work and I uh, just found myself drawing pictures to music a lot. My parents got me a computer and, uh, you know, I started in the Houston's punk rock scene doing flyers and I moved to the, like the electronic music, rave culture, doing those flyers. Uh, I grew up at, by Eggers home. So, you know, some friends rap, they, I knew Photoshop, they asked me to do their album cover and it, it, it just took off from there. But I wanted to be involved in music. I wanted to do art for music. And when I kind of discovered the hip hop world, like it was new to me. Um, I didn't realize Houston had such a vibrant culture. So I I'd seen it as my way into the music. And I just, it was like an adventure. I just went after it. And G Dash is here. So I, I did a couple covers. And one day G Dash walked through my studio in Montrose that I had with a, a DJ named Chris Anderson. And it just started taking off. It got real quiet when you said, do y'all know who G-Dash is? Swish House. Y'all make some noise for Swish House? Yeah. All right. Shout out to G-Dash, man. 
So what was, because um, I know you said the rave and all that, like I know we were talking backstage and you were saying, you know, Orbit kind of got you in, but like what was some of the, the first, like they weren't legends at the time, but who went on to be Houston legends that you started getting involved with? Um, I mean, it's just name anybody from Houston. They, a lot of them became legends. Like so. who's the who's the first though? Like who's the first? Who's the, yeah. You know, everybody was kind of popping off at the same time. I think. You know, when I when I started doing graphics, like of course I was getting the artists who did, who were nobodies who didn't have much money. Um, you know, I was new to the business and. You know, I didn't really chase the bigger guys. I just looked around me and, and whoever wanted to work. But I would say Swisher House really became the first as a group became a legend and they branched off into a bunch of different legends. But then like the, uh, you know, some of the South Side guys started coming with me, but it was mostly North Side Houston for me, um, like Slim Thug, Chameleon Air, Paul Wall. They all kind of popped off at the same time. Um, and it, it was, you know, it was a, it was really about, you know, about a what was two thousand five year grind of just doing these covers. But it, it all happened at the same time. They all got signed at the same time. The mixtape culture took off at the same time. Yeah. But so it was it was it wasn't one blew up and then everybody else. I mean, everybody blew up at the same right, time. Right, right. But I was saying, like, is there a particular? There's some. He named some of the projects though. Like, what are some of the things? I mean, you if you don't know Mike Frost or his work, you know Mike Frost and his work. I guarantee you, one of your favorite albums is probably something that he designed. You know. So, what are some of the first like albums, mixtapes? I want to put a, a pinpoint on this. Um, man, let me go. With it's it's there's just so many of them it's hard to say so the first ones i would you know the first man it's it's hard for me to say i don't remember what you did mixtape you know messiah for chameleon air took off having things for slim thug started taking off i actually gave orbit because we were in my office and all the covers were coming to me and orbit's like man i need some work so i was like dude i'm gonna give you the next one that comes through the door and it was Paul Wall and Chameleon Air on Get Your Mind Correct. But that one really popped off. Um, you know, all the Swisher House mixtapes were going, were, were popping off. The, uh, you know, the, the first album that really went, just blew up was Mike Jones, though. Hmm. The Who Is Mike Jones? Who Is Mike Jones is the first thing that, like, that was my first major experience that really blew up. And then it was Paul, and then it was Slim. Um, and then Chameleon Air came after that. Yeah. Can you talk about just your whole approach? Because, I mean, you do a, a, a very job, a very great job and a very particular about, like, capturing, because we're talking about the Dirty South, like, capturing those elements, the grills, the swangers, the, you know, just talk about your whole approach to, uh, to the art, man. You know, actually, swangers weren't, if you look through all my photos, there might only be two photo shoots that have swangers in them back in the day. Everybody was on blades. Yeah. Um, you know, you didn't have, swangers were rare until Texas Wire and Will came around. So it was, uh, you know, it was a little bit different. The, uh, I lost my train of thought, though. What was the question? No, we're just talking about just your approach of just, like, oh, capturing the, the southern, you know, I, lifestyle. You know, when I, I looked at the quality that New York and L.A. had, so one of my early things was I wanted to match their quality. And, it, you know, it, when, you're, when you're making art, like, a lot of times people are looking for concepts. So my concept was always the person that I was working for. So like my dad used to tell me, you know, if you can take what's in my head and put it on a piece of paper, son, you might have a business. So I, you know, I kind of took that to heart. So when I, I always approached the artist like I was telling a story. So if you look at like Slim and like the boss, if you look at Paul, like the people's champ, you know, I, I would look at Paul and look at who he was. I would look out into society I was like, I don't have to make the whole world like this guy, but there's people that are going to like him that I need to almost give them like a hero, tell a story of success so they can relate to that. And the people who are not going to like him anyways, I need to just make them hate him as much as possible mm -hmm. to keep him talking. So, I mean, that's, that was the mythology behind, you know, we only took six pictures on Paul Wall where he had the grill because he just got that diamond grill. And he had it wrapped up in a, a paper napkin in his pocket. He pulled it out. And he's like, man, should I put it in the grill? And I was like, yeah. But we only took six pictures. But when we looked at the cover, I was like, this is perfect because it fits that thing. Like, it, it shows success. 
you know, it, it has a quality that I'm looking for, which quality has another way of showing success. And, and before that, everybody was like loading covers up with diamonds or jewels or like there was this kind of like comic style to it. So I, I wanted it to be real, but I also wanted to build characters out of the, these people, but characters who they really wore. Hmm. Yeah. So you were saying, um, it's interesting you said about the grill with Paul Wall, because I mean, to hear him be like, should I use the grill, should I not? And it's like, if you mention Paul Wall nine times out of 10, the next thing somebody's gonna say is like grill, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't separate the two now. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, I just looked at it, I remember Dash was in the office and we were debating on the cover stuff. And I was like, no nah, man, this is it. Like this is, uh, it's, uh, we gotta go with it. I've never seen anything like it. Like, it. so yeah, that's, it's, you know, with all the things, the, the concept has always been the artist for me. That's my creative approach. Mm. And like how, you know, and back then too, like you, you want to turn people into stars. You want to like build this identity. So, um, you know, I just, I dug into them. I study people. And I, I not only study people, but I also like, it's, it sounds kind of bad, but I take stereotypes and I break them into sub stereotypes. And I try to break it down into where there's at least a million people like this in a market. And I, I try to build the character of this person and then go after the market of the people that, that like them. So I, I don't really market to the rap crowd. I just, I market to the people that are like the artists that I'm building marketing for. Hmm. That's what's up, man. So Georgie, man, what's going down? Good, man, just staying busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, man, just talk about just your, your early beginnings, because I mean, one thing with you in particular, you made it a point to do like from the South, a kid from the South, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, like keep Very going. intentional, you know what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, no, nah, I just wanted to tell a uh, like story early on about like what inspired me and where I came from, you know what I mean? Like my origins. Um, around that time, so like 06, which is considered like the everybody was on the rise, all the albums were dropping for Houston, I was 16. Hmm. So at that time, I didn't have access to much and I was broke, I was, I was a kid. So that's when ripping from the internet, getting your favorite rappers albums early, you know what I mean? I messed up bootlegging time, but the thing is I didn't, you know, I was a kid without money, so I guess I was bootlegging my favorite artist's <laughs> albums. But the, the bad part about that was we, when we were bootlegging these albums, we didn't get the sleeves, we didn't get the cover art, we didn't get the backtrack, we didn't get none of this. So a lot of times when I saw these, this artwork blown up, it was at the car shows, it was when I was, hitting my favorite sh shops at the mall, hmm. buying, you know, street shirts, and you'd see the promos on the wall. And I, anytime I could get my hands on one, I'd take it home, I'd take it home. 90% of that work was his, you know what I mean? Or somebody- Did you know it was Mike Frost or you just knew like- Not at the time, no, because yeah, I was yeah. just so obsessed with the quality that I was just taking them home. And I'd throw them up on my wall. Of course, I got all these bootlegs burnt, but I don't have the artwork. And that's what I feel like still connects people to the music. You need the artwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the CD's cool. Especially at that time, you got all these songs on different CDs, but you need the artwork. So I'm seeing all this artwork and I'm like, this shit is amazing. Like, I don't have no computer or nothing, but like, this shit is amazing. I'm, I'm obsessed with it. The first time I finally got my hands on Photoshop was high school. I ended up having to take a journalism class. Hmm. Now, I didn't want to take journalism, but I was, I made the decision of not picking my electives. Pulled up to high school and they're like, you got journalism. I'm like, well, I'm here now, you know, let's just hmm. figure it out. So teacher pulls up Photoshop. Of course, it wasn't a common term like now, like you just throw it out like that looks Photoshopped. It wasn't like that. So I loaded up. I think the first project they told me to put together was somebody who inspires you. I think I did like a really bad cut of Slim in front of, like a, of the first slab picture I found on Google. Hmm. It, looking back, it probably was terrible, but you know what I mean? That was the start of something. Did, did, are you you're getting the buzz then? Like, hey, I might kind of be into this graphics thing. Like, That's what really got me hooked. It was really like seeing what the program could do and then keeping in mind all the artwork that I saw coming up. I have these posters at my house. I want to replicate this. I want to make quality like this because other than that, I haven't seen the two, you know, around. So I just kept that in mind throughout the years. I stuck at Photoshop. I was doing artwork for homies. Anybody I can really just get my hands on. You need a artwork? 50 bucks, I got you, 40 bucks, I got you. I'm just trying to get my name out. But at the same time, inspiration-wise, I still got all these posters from when I was 16 in the back of my head, like, these, this is the stuff I look up to. At the time, I didn't know none of my information or knowledge or who these people were, but as I got older, I figured out about Mike, everything that came with him and how much he inspired everything. And you can still see it in my early work. You know, you look, a lot of my early photos, you could tell that, you know, inspired by that. But I just kept that in my mind. I kept it going. At the same time, it's like, when it was my time to kind of show my artwork to Houston, you always see the homage of the South in it, you know what I mean? Just because that's what I grew up on, so 
to me, it's easy to make that artwork because that's what that's what I know. Hmm. So there's no there's no faking it. You know what I mean? That's me. Yeah. So yeah. Are you are you still um, like Mike said? You know, he's not really about. He's more so about like the character and the person and all that. Mm-hmm. Like, what's your whole approach? You know what I'm saying? Everything. I think it's along the lines of him. It's like you're trying to you're trying to take this concept and the person, and you're trying to build something that represents them and also kind of me i'm real cinematic about everything so i just want everything even if it's the smallest project i just want to blow people away with it like it could be the simplest idea like a lot of people know me from my work with my brother les and it's like we'll have the smallest idea but i want to blow that up i want to make it look crazy even if it's something we shot behind a building and it took two minutes i want i don't want it to look like that i want them to look and be like you shot that there damn that looks crazy and i still take that approach to everything it's like dramatic cinematic like let's let's go all out do y'all have any stories like uh, similar to that to where it's like, man, this looks like this, but you have no idea what it took to get this image the way that we needed to get? Huh. If I would say mine, I would just say that uh, one of their, everybody's favorite covers that I've done was uh, Midnight Club 2 by Les mm. with Rogers. And everybody loves that photo, but that wasn't supposed to be the cover art for that. One of our, our friends recommended it as the cover. And uh, if you look at that photo, it looks beautiful. There's like a looks like a meteor is going through the sky and it's nighttime. Man, that was like one o'clock in Galveston, sunny as hell. But I just, I, yeah, I, I had to edit the shit out of that picture. But everybody looks at it, it's like, that's one of the most beautiful pictures at nighttime ever. But that's, that's probably something crazy to me. Yeah. Mike, can you talk about, can you talk about this Gangster Fire cover right here? Oh, yeah. The, uh, yeah, Trey, Trey, like, that's actually the, the outline from the Zero self-titled album from the photo. So I already had the cutouts and Trey came in my office and he's like, man, I need a cover. And I'm like, all right. Well, he's like, no, nah, like 10 minutes, I need a cover. <laughs> so I, I put that together as fast as I could, but me and him talked about this, Gangstified is misspelled. And like, I won't change it because it's the original one. <laughs> oh, G-A-N-G, oh. <laughs> it was really like a five minute cover, Trey. There is no proof. Gangstified, okay, yeah. Damn, yeah, man. <laughs> It's a legendary era right there, man. <laughs> and like I look at it, I'm like, man, should I change it? Like, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible about proofreading too. So it just remind, I'm gonna leave it there as a reminder to proofread. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's um, cause Mike, I mean, you were there, man, when Houston was like, when it were on, man, all over the TV, man. Talk about just that era and what that meant to be in your position at that time. I didn't quite hear you. What was the uh? You know what I'm saying? Just talk about that era, man, because, you know, you were, you were there in the meat of, like, when Houston was really on. You know what I mean? Like, just talk about being in your position at that particular time. You know, it was, uh, I think a lot of it is right place, right time, and the right person with the right drive and energy to do it. But it was, it was just crazy. It was like, it was like an adventure. Like, it was, it was just this vibrant, you know, it's, it's this vibrant community, like, you know, Swisher House came to me, and then, you know, everybody from Swisher House started coming. People in the South. I, I had no idea there was so many artists and so many people. So while I'm figuring out the scene and the culture and all the players and all that stuff, everybody's coming to me. So it was, it was great. It was just like there's so much energy, so much music coming out. There was so much culture. You know, we were doing all the street promotions. Like, you couldn't go anywhere in Houston without being exposed to, to Houston's rap culture. But it was, it was, man, it was the funnest time of my life. It was great. It was like the greatest adventure ever. Yeah. Were people, cause I mean, once you, you're out there, you're out there, like who's like coming to reach, are people outside of the, the city or like the state coming to reach out to you? Like, man, I want the Mike Frost, I want the Mike Frost look. Yeah, some people have the, uh, you know, I've, I've done stuff for like Killer Mike and Common and other people, but you know, people did come out. I never really marketed myself. Um, and there was so much work in Houston, I never really had to worry about any other place. But I did realize when I got to the major level and started doing that stuff, it was actually harder for me to do those commission type projects where I, I didn't have this relationship with the artist because it didn't match my creative approach. Hmm. So I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know anything about their crowd. And I actually found that I couldn't do it. So. I was just comfortable doing stuff here. Hmm. And you know, like back then too, it was, if you were a kid from Houston and you wanted to be in music business, you wanted to be in art, like LA, and especially if you're from the hood, LA and New York were far away, you weren't getting there. So like one of my goals was like, 
put my own city on, make my own city cool. That's why I, I copied the quality from New York and stuff like that. So it was just like, you know, it was crazy mission driven, high energy. Like, it was wild. Yeah. I mean, it was really wild. You want to talk about it? Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what? I got some stories. Let's go. Wild. That's what we're here for. I remember one time with Trey. Like, you know, Trey came up to the office. First time I ever actually did a photo shoot, I bought this, like, $700 camera. It was, like, first digital. It was, like, 6 megapixel. I pulled it out of the box and just basically, like, here and just shot pictures of him sitting in the chair, and I made Resurrected out of it. So Trey's like, all right, we're done. We're, he wanted to do another album, so he comes and picks me up from the office. We go to Wendy's. Like, there's this big old commotion, and I'm riding with Dougie D, and I look through the window, and Trey's, like, holding the guy through the drive through window. <laughs> and I'm just like, you know, then we go do the photo shoot, and there's like, and, you know, I'm, I'm pretty green at that point, too. Like, I'm... It's like, man, I better get these photos right, man. I don't want to No, be I mean, just green. Like, <laughs> all this stuff is so new. Like, I mean, I, I grew up in the hood, but I, I stayed... I was a nerd. I, I played with my computer. I played with my Legos. I, like, drew pictures. I worked at a comic book store. <laughs> So now I'm like, you know, in this rap gangster culture is like, and there was nobody else running around with the camera, especially a white kid back then in there. So I used to go, it was just a wild experience. Like, and I, I noticed back then too, I would get like do these photo shoots and it's like two pit bulls and Trey and six homeboys. And we'd go through downtown. And I mean, people would like, you know, business owners would be looking out their window, wanting to see what comes on, like the police would stop by. So it was, it was just, it was cool too back then because now it's common, but nobody was doing that. There, there wasn't any, anybody, any street photographers out there. Just, I mean, there might have been in other cities, but there wasn't here. So at this time, you're pretty much like the main, you're the, you're the only one for the most part. Like. Um, I always tell this too, like I, I tried to get a, Orbit told me about Pen and Pixel, I tried to get a job there. Like I didn't really have art school or really have the skills to get it. Um, so yeah, I, I was about the only one, I think, Kid Styles was, you know, doing stuff, and Black Cat was doing stuff, but I think it was just us. I, I, if I'm forgetting anybody, but it wasn't, it wasn't much. Hmm. Yeah, man, uh, Georgie, man, talk a little bit about because you've been able to take it beyond, and I mean Mike as well, but Georgie really diving in with the merch and just hmm. beyond, just you know, graphics and, and pictures and stuff like that, man. Yeah. Just talk about your whole approach with all of that because everything is southern driven. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh man, I just try to make. Stuff dedicated to here that I think people would appreciate and connect to. Like Mike says, you see a lot of the, like pride and you see a lot of cool things in other cities and everybody's proud and they got their merch. And I know like a lot of times people like to wear stuff from other places and that's fine too. But we can have, you know, cool things too from, you know, good artists here. Hmm. So that's kind of been my approach is like I want to make good stuff for everybody. And I've had, I've had, I've been blessed to be able to be in so many different outlets that I can put my creative touch on, you know, a lot of things. Cause I, I, well, that was my key. One of my key things that f when I first started was I wanted to be good at a lot of things. So I taught myself early on. I was like, I want to get in the video. I want to be in the photo. I want to be in graphic design. I want to design merch. I, uh, my f the first merch I was designing was when I was like 18, 19. So I was like 08, 09. And I just kept it going from there. But at the same time, I, I was touching up on my, all my skills because I didn't want to just be like, I feel like sometimes people be like, yeah, that, that dude's a jack of all trades. You know what I mean? He can do all this stuff. But I feel like sometimes it's like they tell you that and they don't mean that you're good at all of it. It just mm. means you could do all that. But I don't want that to mean the same thing for me. I wanted people to be like, he's cold at everything he does. So I made it, made it my thing to make sure that everything I did, people were like, he's, he's good. You know what I mean? It's no, no doubt that he, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, about the Dio's brand, man? Cause that's the, yeah, you know, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I started been, it up probably what, like a year or so ago, and it's, just, yeah. it's, just been it's just been taking off. Yeah, we completed our year in July, and then our uh, the, the storefront in downtown completes a year in like two weeks. Yeah. But um, yeah, we launched that in the middle of the, when the pandemic started, so it was iffy, you know what I mean? But that was a long time coming. It was just a brand that we really had a concept behind me and my brother Les for like a long time. And we just... We took our time with it, I ain't gonna lie, because we went back and forth on names, and at first we wanted to call it Did It Yourself, but it's like when you type in Did It Yourself on YouTube, you're getting mm -hmm. everybody and their mom on there, so it's just like that. Ain't. But uh, the idea came when we were on a flight come back from Japan, um, I thought of Dios, and of course it doesn't abbreviate. It's real but, quick, we were on a flight on the way back from Japan. Yeah, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, and then it just hit me real quick, so I told Les, and then he was like, yo, that's fire. So I was like, all right, well, let me keep that in my head. And it doesn't abbreviate perfectly, like, you know, it's not, 
ourselves in two words, but I was like, you know what, fuck it. I don't think it's gonna bother nobody. Mm. So we did it, and uh, immediately we just, you know, made it, made sure everybody got the message. It's kind of like a a point to where we're at now. Where we've been able to kind of just control everything that we we're, we create and full creative control over everything that we release. It's us. Nobody's telling us what to do. And just kind of showing up to this point where we're capable capable of. So that's that's what the store and all the clothing represents. And people caught that message on early. So, I mean, we've been blessed to have Houston support just for this first year. And it's like every drop we've been able to do, it's like, you know, the you'll see pictures of like the, the block where the store is at, just everybody coming out and showing love. And it's honestly, it's amazing. How do, how do you uh, create that type of buzz so fast? I don't know, because me and Gus talked about this. And it's like, we don't purposely try, but it's just like, our, our key thing is like, man, we just want to make dope shit for people to really just see and like feel connected to. You know what I mean? I feel like as long as you're creative and whatever whatever outlet you in, if you're making something you're connected to and you know people are gonna f- feel, they'll they'll gravitate towards it naturally. You know what I mean? You don't have to force it. And I feel like that's where we're kind of blessed right now. We just trying to make sure that everything we put out is fire and people want to support it and be proud to wear it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Talk about, uh, cause Mike gave us a good story, man, with the, with the trade thing. You got any stories, man, just uh, just from throughout your journey, man? Nah, not that I can think of immediately. Uh, only, nah, not that I can think of. I, when I think of that, I just kind of think of like my come up and trying to, trying to book people. And I mean, when I started early on, I think I only had like two, you know, two underground videos and nobody wanted to book me for nothing. And I was at, the, I, I mean, you could, my friends always bring this up, but I remember being at the mall with them and having these flyer postcards. I think I had graphics on there for 30 bucks, music videos for $100. And nobody was hitting me up, but I learned something through that. You know, we're at the mall passing all these cards out trying to get me business for, you know, nothing. And it didn't work, but it taught me something. It's like, Sometimes you want to promote yourself, and then Mike talked about it. It's like sometimes you want to market yourself, but it's like it, it's not. I, you don't really have to do it the way you think you have to. You know what I mean? You don't have to be out here telling people your prices and please book me. I would love to work with you. Sometimes you just need to work with people who appreciate you. Y'all gonna connect on the project, and customers or anybody who just wants to collaborate with you, they'll come naturally because your work is speaking for itself. I learned that through that, you know. Um, and which I, I learned fast because I was taking some jobs that I just wasn't happy about. It's like, yeah, you know, here's a hundred bucks for this. And then you're just like, I really don't like this cover, but fuck it, you know, whatever. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, Mike, um, man, what's, your, what's some of your favorite covers, man? You gotta have one. Top uh, five, top five Mike Frost covers of all time. The recent Paul Wall, Akira based one, because uh, I just, I'm a big anime fan and you know, I spent so long doing that a creative approach where I'm making things for off that, like building these characters and identities. I haven't really injected much of myself as far as my personal taste, so I like that one. Uh, Devin the Dude's Acoustic Levitation, mm. where he's like... Uh, With his legs yeah, on it. Yeah. yeah. Um, the uh, top five, Resurrected. The uh, People's Champ, just because... It, it was like the first time I had confirmation that my approach was working. Um, the uh, like real like big confirmation, and I probably boss of all bosses mm. for Slim Thug, which was that just that whole project. Because on that project, the first project I did with Interscope, because I had Mike Jones, I had Slim Thug, like I, everybody was on the majors, they're on different labels, they're competing. So I did Slim Thug's cover, and I, I purposely went reference pen and pixel style a little bit with the shiny letters, which I didn't do that before, because it was, you know, it just, I just wanted to make everything so fucking Houston that it hurt, because I knew I had three, four major albums, and I, I just wanted to just be flagrant with the Houston kind of style. And uh, so on that Interscope thing, I got called by Interscope and I went into the lady's office and she accused me of plagiarizing like of the Mike Jones cover or something for Slims. And I was like, I did that cover too. Like, how am I going <laughs> to plagiarize myself? <laughs> and I was like, yo, I know you have your agenda, but I got my agenda too. This is what I'm trying to do. And me and them went around and they made me actually change the cover. So his next album was coming around and I kind of figured out what the game was then. So I was like, you know what? I took my own money, I spent like six grand on that cover doing the production, 
and did the entire project and went back to Interscope when they had like their meeting to talk about the artwork and I just turned the whole thing in because it was 20 grand on the line hmm. too. So I was like, I ain't gonna take this from me. I know y'all trying to get rid of me, but it ain't gonna happen. Yeah. So yeah. that was my favorite too, because it was, you know, unfortunately the music industry kind of crashed right after that, but I was like just hitting that stride, you know, I was really aggressive at it. And that was like a, that one means something personal to me too. And it came out, it came out great. Yeah. No, nah, it is a different ground. I mean, and Georgia, I mean, you've been able to really master that independent, like mm. underground, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, just talk about that whole grind, man. Like being able to do that. Just up to the, man, I just, uh, my last uh, nine to five was in 2010. And uh, not that I got none, nothing against nine to fives. I mean, if you can hustle every different way and have multiple, you know, uh, revenue sources, do it. But um, I was working a warehouse job. So I was tw 20, but um, yeah, I was just, I was like, this isn't it. I was getting home tired. I wanted to work on my computer and make art and I just had no time. And I was just like, I had to make a decision. Like either I do this or leave. But if I leave, I remember my sister telling me like, if you leave, you got bills, you know what I mean? So it's like, just make sure whatever you do, you're gonna have to try to make some money. So I was like, well, I'm, I'm here now. So I, I remember quitting and being like, I'm doing this full time. And it's been a blessing because that was the last job I had up until this point. So it's been nothing but, but grinding. But um, I've been able to balance that with just making sure I do things that make me happy. I think that's a key thing because a lot of people ask, you know, how'd you do it up until this point to be able to just be self-reliant? It's just like just make sure you're doing things that make you happy and make, leave you inspired and consistent. You know what I mean? Um, breaks are good, but long breaks aren't. So you always got to make sure you're just, you're just on it. But I've been blessed to, you know, be able to have – people like my brother Les to keep me inspired and everybody around me that, you know, my whole team that we keep working. And even when it comes to the store like that, it keeps me busy. It keeps me creating and I keep going. And it's like, it's natural at this point. Cause I know like if I'm sitting still for too long, I'm the type of person, like I have to be working on something, even if it's something for myself or the brand or less, I have to be working on something. I can't sit still. So that's, you know, that's, that's been good for me. Yeah. Mike, you said something about like being, you know, very adamant about being so fucking Houston. Can you tell me what that means to you? Like just being a Houston guy, what does it mean to be from the city? Um, man? You know, I think it just comes from that feeling, the, just that underdog feeling, getting passed over, like things aren't reachable to you. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a Houston attitude. It's just like, man, we can do it ourselves. So. No pun intended. No, that's, I mean, you know, that's like, <laughs> It's, it's crazy how many parallels me and Georgie have on stuff. Like, I mean, I, I spotted him out a long time ago. I was like, this kid's going to do something because I could, just, I could just tell when I was talking to him and watching the work. The, um, it's, it's just, it's, that's Houston. I mean, that's, it's a hustle city. Like SPM with Hustle Town and that. I mean, it's, and if you really listen to a lot of Houston music, it's actually, most of it's positive. It's about grinding. It's about working hard. It's about being real. It's about... Um, and I could get behind that too. So on it, the uh, but it's uh, yeah. Nice. George, is it is it kind of the same for you? Exactly the same. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's just, like he said, a lot of the music is inspiring. It's gonna make you want to grind, make you want to work. And a lot of times, like when we're doing merch or product, it's for those people. You know what I mean? It's self motivating. You know what I mean? Putting this shirt on, hoping it inspires you to wake up the next day and go harder than the last one. You know? So it's it's the same message. Yep. Yeah, uh, man, I'm, I'm really fiending for another story, Mike, man. What you got for me, man? The first one was so amazing. Oh, man, there's a... Something that ain't going to get nobody... I got no, nothing, nothing, You know, with a statute I'm, of limitations. I'm rolling, up through, and, you know, we don't I'm rolling through the Rolodex of stories right now. I don't want to tell anything that's not work safe. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't... You can't... I'll think of something in a second. There's a... I, can't, I ain't going to tell that one. Um... <laughs> Give me a Mike Jones story. Because you were with Mike when he, like, I mean, who was hotter than Mike Jones in 2005? You know, Mike was a special guy. Um, the, uh, I don't really have that many Mike Jones stories. Like, because we, we worked together. I did the photo shoots on the projects and stuff like that. But the, uh, yeah, no, I don't have any Mike Jones stories, really. Yeah. That, nothing that's funny or, or things like that. The, uh, I got a rap a lot story, so, you know I, I ain't aware that rap a lot's like, the godfather of gangster rap culture or whatever. 
so uh, are you that green when you got into I was it? that green <laughs> so and I was dealing with Mike Mack and Mike Mack gave me a, like a CD with some pictures on it like a burnt CD and he calls me back like six months later this is the first thing with him he's like Ross I need that CD and I'm like what CD man what I guess he somebody asked him for it I was like, I ain't got the damn CD. So he, he developed like this, I get, I don't know, I was just talking smack. So it comes back later on and, and I'm always having to deal with him on these projects. And I finished the project, but he owes me a check. And he calls me and he has me on speakerphone. I guess all our rap lots there. And uh, he's like, Mike, I need that artwork. And I'm like, I need my fucking check. <laughs> <laughs> and then I hear everybody at the table in rap a lot like, Start kind of laughing and Prince in the background. He's like, "Man, cut him a check." <laughs> <laughs> but Mike was like, "He, Mike, I love Mike Mac to death." But he was always like, "Now I look at it, I'm like, okay, I'm like maybe uh, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't quite understand the whole, the whole thing." But it, that's amazing that you weren't even aware. Of, uh, do you have any more stories like that? Cause that's a, that's a, that's crazy that you got into hip hop not even aware of like rap a lot and that whole thing like. Man, I I was like I said I was I was aware of UGK because I listened to him, but I like I was I went to punk rock shows and I was going to rave shows and like my homeboys around the neighborhood rap, and I knew they rap, but I didn't, and I knew like rap a lot from like ghetto boys. But I didn't pay attention to all that stuff. Like I I did my computer work. I wanted to make artwork. I loved to make it to music. So it was uh, and Michelle, my wife knows this about me. If it ain't. If it's not what I'm focused on, I'm probably not aware of it. Like I don't, I don't pay attention to the rest of the world. But so, but once I dive in, it's like an adventure on that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, Georgia, man, what y'all got coming up next with Dios, man? Oh uh, man, Sunday we have, uh, which is pretty tight, cause like a check off the, the bucket list. But uh, we got a collab with Bun, dropping this Sunday at the shop. So I can make some noise for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, now nah, it's super exciting, cause. Um, it's like something that, you know, as, as, a, as a teenager, you didn't think it was possible. You know what I mean? Me editing out of my, my crib at 18, 19, I didn't think I was going to have a collab with Bun one day for a store that I, I run, you know, with my friends downtown. So it's amazing. But, yeah, um, he had a full creative range. We went back and forth on opinions, and we finalized the last three, uh, three four items that we released. And so it's a, it's a big deal for me, and it's, it's, it's a big blessing. So. so yeah, and this is multiple releases, right? It's like shirts, hoodies, all yeah, that? Yeah, we're doing three T-shirts, a hoodie, and two pendants. So yeah, having the having the permission to, you know, use use Trill and combine it with ours and coming up with the slogan, did a Trill, it's, it's dope. You know, it's amazing. It's not something that, you know, I, would, I thought of a long time ago, so. Yeah, pretty cool. Mike, talk about a little bit about uh, because I mean you're heavy in the merch too, man. With just the boxes, you know, I know you had the box mm -hmm. of Paul and you know the the boards and just all kind of stuff, man. Yeah, I think you know the box was just an experiment. We're about to do another one, but that was just like a proof of concept. We only made a hundred of them. Uh, I think, and I, me and Georgie had a conversation about this a long time ago. So when I was doing all those covers, I mean, I I, I had everybody like I dominated the city on that stuff for 10 years like I had Ed, literally every artist so I quit like 2013 we had I had kids bills but the music industry went down at the same time so I didn't start back up till about 2017 I was like you know I've been programming at Exxon I was like you know I really miss this I have to get back into it I'm not happy unless I'm doing it and I had to think about it took me a while to think about how I wanted to get back in and I realized like the old model was gone um, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna do everybody's, but people, you know, there's younger people doing it for a cheap price. I'm not, I'm too old to go back and compete. I don't want to, I don't wanna do that. So, you know, I, I was talking to Georgie one time outside of a smoke shop and I was like, you know, I think the model now is find an artist you really work with and start developing a brand with them that is more than, like I told Paul, I was like, I'm not gonna put your, picture your face on stuff like we're going to build a brand that represents the culture and that's what we did with the Euler mob so you know I just started working with him it was something we could experiment I could play with ideas and you know I w just started making stuff and we, I've got new stuff coming but you know if you go to New York or you go to other places you know you have the, you have toys you have all these things that are being manufactured and we don't have that here so I think really with this what me and Georgia are trying to bring Mm. Um, you know, there's a, 
it's and it's a new I think creative model that works and I, I tell other designers this like don't go chase the big people they're not going to respect you like find somebody who has a work ethic that you believe in and y'all start building a brand that represents something more to y'all together so the merchandise is a part of that hmm. um, and you know with with just going to keep growing that direction. You know, the NFT stuff is really big right now. I'm moving in that direction. Um, I'm going to combine that with the brands, combine that with like animations and other stuff. So it's, uh, it's definitely on the creative end. It's a new adventure for me. So doing, you know, I've done over a thousand album covers. It, it gets boring. So for me, it's a way to, to, to creatively have fun again. Like it's, it's awesome to do. It gives as a designer, I think the combination of merchandise and the NFT stuff that's coming um, and working with an artist, you know, like he's, they've done a great job of creating their own lane and their own brand. And I just, I think that's, that's the new model. And I, I think as a designer, if you're not pushing yourself to get past t-shirts, get past hats, to get off the screen, to get off printed paper and, and get into real world objects, you know, to get into product design, to get into coding and combine these things together. Like, it, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna limit yourself. So for me, making the merchandise is, is, is a step in elevating myself as a designer. Yeah, yeah. Georgie, um, oh, I'm sorry, before we get to Georgie. Is that, cause you were just saying like, you've done, you know, over a thousand covers. Like, is it now just about just being comfortable or do you still have like new goals that you want to achieve and like new things that you're aspiring to do? You know what's weird is I named my company like self-employed a long time ago. In 2013, I had to go get a job at Exxon. Yeah. And it's, it's great, like, but I just, I, I wanna go back to just doing, doing art all day again. So like, for me, taking this path and doing this stuff, it's, it's, I had to realize when I stopped in 2013, like nobody was waiting at the door for me to do stuff when I wanted to come back in. Like I had to start over and not only start over is I have to, when I moved out of my mom's house, I didn't have a job. I just had Russell Washington that wanted me to do a postcard. So i rented an apartment with no job. It's like, I'm gonna work at McDonald's or I'm gonna make design stuff work. And now I have a family and it's much bigger bills, much bigger things, but I'm actually back where I started. Like now my mind is I'm gonna, my goal is to use all this stuff to get back to just being self-employed and, and hustling art and creative stuff all day. Is it, do you see newer artists and you're like, man, I would like to kind of do some stuff with them. Is it something um, that you see? Sometimes. Yeah. The, uh, I'm, I'm just now getting there. Um, like, like um, just my mind's in the right place to be there again, to, to, to look for new artists and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm open to it. When I, I, I wasn't too much in the past, um, but now I'm opening up to it. Yeah. Can you um, top five artists? We'll do this because we're gonna close out in a minute. Let me get y'all's top five. Top five. Uh, you can do Southern or Houston. However you wanna, however you want to divide it up. Top five artists all time. Artists? Yeah. That's gonna be biased because I'm. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Top five artists. You got yours. In Houston, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a man. This stuff's gonna go live. I ain't, it's gonna be on the internet. I ain't saying that. No, <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, who I listen to the most is I listen to I listen to Zero and Devin the Dude the most. Mm. Um, I listen to a lot of Paul Wall. I don't know if it's because we hang out all the time and I just looking for ideas or if, if I like I, I like his stuff. I listen to Paul Wall. Um, I listen to a lot of UGK still. And uh, listen to a lot of Trey. Hmm. So I, 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 that's what I listen to. I don't. Wait, what was the last one you said? Dre? Trey. Oh, Trey. 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 Oh, Trey. Well, Trey yeah, like ABN, oh, Trey, yeah, like yeah, yeah. early Trey. I actually haven't listened to any new Trey in a while, but all the early stuff. Did you do the ABN cover? Yeah, I did all the ABNs too. Can you talk about that? Because we'll, um, we'll probably never see that again, so we can get some stories from. Um, <laughs> man, the the. You know, the early covers, like, like he said, like, people want to pay you 100 bucks or whatever, so I'm just trying to get that stuff done. So, yeah, the first Train Zero cover, we just, like, drove around. The, the place where I rented the cameras, there was a concrete wall, so I was like, man, we're going to shoot right here. <laughs> get out the so way. I rented the cameras, 
shot it right there and then returned the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> I shot them in the parking lot of the camera rental place for ABN and that, they came so raw that they fit. I just posted a picture yeah. recently and it actually got like 30,000 impressions like and thousands of likes. I normally get like 300 likes. I'm like, <laughs> what, what the hell? But there's that one for the first ABN and then the second ABN, um, Trey and them had this house on the west side and you know, it was a house, it was like a frat house. There's like dudes everywhere, cars everywhere. And uh, you know, we shot that in his garage. I've got some, that was actually all shot in his garage. So if you look at the actual cover, you're talking about editing a lot of stuff out. Man, I like edited the water cooler out, the garage door. <laughs> um, but yeah, everything was just done really, really raw. So, and as I moved to 2005 and things were getting more major, I used to put so much pressure on myself to like keep getting more expensive cameras and bigger setups and bigger lights. And I realized over the years, now when I go back into stuff, I actually, I take what I've learned on the technical side, but I actually go back and shoot like I used to. I shoot in a very raw way, hmm. like, like, like very fast, very like, um, I don't worry about overproduction and stuff. Cause I see you agree. You kind of agree with that, George. You're the same with you, like going back and understanding, like, yeah, I don't really have to go and no, use all the equipment and I'm everything. I'm gonna be honest. A lot of the times, and I, I see it now that he posts a lot of behind the scenes work. A lot of the times, when you're doing something that's going to be considered classic or timeless later, it's something that you did like this, and you weren't thinking. You were just like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And then later, it's like when it gets created into something that's like everybody's like, oh, that's my favorite, or damn, that's a, one of the craziest pictures ever. It's a lot of times when you're working, it was just something that's just like that, and you keep going. Hmm. And it's something you made out of nothing. Like you said, like shooting around the corner right from where you get the camera from. That's a lot of times how it works. It's just here, like in general, like you're trying to make something that's like, all right, well, don't think. We just, let's make this work here. Let's make this work right here. Just go, go, go. So, there's yeah. a, yeah, and there's... There is something to say because now everybody has high quality cameras and stuff like that. So there is a certain amount. I think if you're dealing with somebody established, there's a certain amount of preparation because I think preparation makes a difference. Mm. But it's still you put that preparation in, but the shooting style is still the same. It's still like it's still fast. Mm. And even on the editing part, like. For every cover I've done, there's 10 of them that nobody's ever seen because I just I iterate through things as fast as possible. And I don't really let my mind get stuck on trying to, it's like, it's how I get over creative block is I just make as many options as I can. Mm -hmm. And then we go over there and look at them and we start refining ones down until we get it. Yeah, that's dope, that's dope. Well, man, we're uh, just about out of time here, but listen, do y'all have anything before we close out? I don't wanna close I'm up. good. Y'all good? Well, listen, can we get a round of applause for Georgie and Mike Frost? <laughs> Cool, cool, listen. Hey, uh, the, all those posters I brought back there on the staircase are free if y'all want them. Fire. It's like my personal stash, so I don't, I don't know if anybody noticed, but. Fire. Okay. You just po free posts in the back already. Uh, listen. <laughs> hey, man, I go by the name of Donnie Houston. I want to thank my guests, Mike Frost and Georgie, for coming through. I appreciate everybody for coming out tonight. And uh, it's the Donnie Houston Podcast. We're out of here. Thank you. Thank you.